Okay. So first off, we're going to do basic muscle structure and function. For those of you who didn't take anatomy, right? And then we're going to deviate highly from what you did in anatomy. We're not going to memorize muscles and their names and their origins and insertions. We're going to talk about how they work. Right, so we're just going to do some basic anatomy that you need to know to understand how muscles contract. Okay, but we're not going to memorize a bunch of muscles and where they are and origins and insertions. Okay, so we have three types of muscles in our body. We have skeletal, and we're going to talk mainly about skeletal in this lecture. Okay, we have cardiac, and we'll talk about cardiac muscle when we talk about cardiac physiology. And then we have smooth muscle, and we're never really going to talk about smooth muscle in detail. Right? All three play really important roles in our body. Okay? Skeletal muscle moves our body. Okay? Here's an actual micrograph of skeletal muscle. It's what's called striated. You see these striations? Highly arranged, really strong contractions can develop. Okay, here we have cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is found only in the heart. The role of the heart is to pump our blood. Cardiac muscle is also striated, so it looks a little similar to skeletal muscle in the fact that it's striated, but you'll notice that its arrangement isn't as highly organized as skeletal muscle, so the contraction that develops isn't quite as strong, but it is still striated. Okay, and then smooth muscle is used to move material out of and within the body. Okay, so smooth muscle lines things like our arteries and arterioles. Our stomach has smooth muscle. Okay, the bladder is made up of smooth muscle. The uterus is made up of smooth muscle. Okay, smooth and cardiac are unconscious. We don't consciously control them, right? They're automatic. Skeletal muscle, we consciously control. Okay, so we can categorize muscle into striated versus unstriated. So skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are striated, meaning they have sarcomeres. Okay, and we'll talk about what sarcomeres are. Okay, smooth muscle is unstriated, not arranged in sarcomeres. Voluntary means that we have conscious control over it. Involuntary means we do not have conscious control over it. Okay, so you cannot consciously tell your heart to slow down. Okay. What do you do to slow your heart rate? What's one thing you can do? Yeah. Change your breathing. Change your breathing because your diaphragm that controls your breathing is skeletal muscle. Okay. So you can consciously control your breathing pattern because your diaphragm is skeletal muscle. Okay. Why are we even talking about muscles? Right. Muscles allow us to move our whole body or just parts of our body. Allows us to manipulate external objects like your fruit by the foot. No, it's fine. <laughs> My daughter wishes I would buy her fruit by the foot. <laughs> okay. It allows you to propel contents through your cardiovascular system, right? It allows you to propel contents through your digestive system. It also allows you to empty contents of certain organs, like your bladder or your colon, to the external environment. Right? So muscle moves things, either the entire body or things within your body. Okay, muscles can only pull, not push. So they're set up in antagonistic pairs. Okay, the origin, so here's the origin of the bicep, is attaching to the stationary bone and the insertion, so here's the insertion of the bicep, is attaching to the mobile bone or the movable bone. Okay, and biceps and triceps work in antagonistic pairs and I will always use biceps and triceps in exam questions or quadriceps and hamstrings, okay? And hopefully you guys know where those four muscles are, even if you haven't taken anatomy, okay? So make sure you know biceps, triceps, quadriceps, and hamstrings.
Okay, those will be the four muscles that I use in exam questions. Okay, let's talk about cellular structure of the muscle. Because we're going to talk about how muscle contracts. In order to understand how muscle contracts, you need to understand the cellular structure. Okay, so here we have a whole bunch of muscle fibers in a fascicle. And a fascicle is just a bunch of muscle fibers wrapped in connective tissue. Okay, and here we have a fascicle that's sort of being pulled out and showing one muscle fiber. The muscle fiber is the cellular unit of your skeletal muscle. Okay, so muscle fibers are cells. Early on in development, multiple cells fuse together. So your muscle fibers run the entire length of your muscle. Okay, and they're multinucleated because during development they fuse together to form a muscle fiber. Okay. Muscle fibers do not replicate themselves. They only will increase and decrease in size. So when you increase muscle mass, you're just making individual muscle fibers bigger. You're not making more muscle fibers. Okay, that's called hypertro hypertrophy. Hypertrophy. Okay, hypertrophy is increase in cell size. So your muscle fibers can increase in size, not number. Okay, so when you damage them, they're done. Okay, inside of muscle fibers, we have myofibrils, okay, that are made up of sarcomeres end to end, which are made up of thick and thin filaments, which are made up of the actin and myosin. Okay, we're going to talk about how actin and myosin interact to cause muscle contraction. So let's look at another figure showing a single muscle fiber. Okay, so here we're seeing a single muscle fiber. The blue things are the nuclei. Okay, so muscle fibers are multinucleated. Okay, and this is just skeletal muscle. We're only talking about skeletal muscle right now. Okay. The plasma membrane of your muscle fibers gets a special name. It's called the sarcolemma. Okay, the cytoplasm inside your muscle fibers gets a special name. It's called the sarcoplasm. Okay, and then your muscle fibers are filled with myofilaments. Okay, and they come in thick and thin. Okay, so your myofilaments are either thick or they are thin. Let's look at another cell. Okay, so another muscle fiber. The endoplasmic reticulum in your muscle fibers also gets a special name. And it's got sarco as a prefix, okay? So it's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay? And it's being shown in this light purple color, okay? So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a specialized form of endoplasmic reticulum, and its main function is to serve as an intracellular storage site for calcium. Where is calcium normally in high abundance? Inside or outside of cells? Outside. Okay. Your skeletal muscles differ in the fact that they have intracellular stores of calcium. Okay, so that calcium's not in the sarcoplasm, i.e. the cytoplasm. It's inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and when your muscle fibers fire action potentials, because muscle is excitable tissue. What those action potentials do is cause the release of that calcium. And it's that calcium being released into the sarcoplasm that causes muscle contraction. Okay, notice our skeletal muscles are innervated by <laughs> motor neurons. And when that innervation occurs, the sarcolemma has all these wrinkles or bumps, okay, to increase the surface area. And that area is called the motor end plate. And who remembers what kind of neurotransmitter motor neurons release? Acetylcholine. And what kind of receptors do skeletal muscles have for acetylcholine? Is it the nicotinic or the muscarinic? Nicotinic. Okay, so those nicotinic cholinergic receptors are going to be on the motor end plate. Okay, some other specialized anatomy in our muscle fibers are these things called transverse tubules. And they're the green 
pores. Okay, so here's a blow up of that neuromuscular junction. So the action potential is gonna propagate along the sarcolemma. And then it's gonna go down the T-tubules to enter the interior of the cell. Okay, so you can think of the T-tubules as invaginations of the sarcolemma. So that the action potential goes along the surface as well as into the interior. And notice that the T-tubules lie really close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and as action potentials go down the T-tubules, it opens up calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium will be released. Okay. Let's talk a little more about those myofibrils now. Okay. So the myofilaments, myofibrils, come in two types, thick and thin. Okay, your thick myofilaments are made up of myosin. Okay, and what happens is you have two myosin molecules, and myosin has a tail region, a neck region, and a head region. Okay, and two molecules of myosin, they're gonna wrap their tail regions together. Okay, and then on the head region, they have an actin binding site, and they have an ATPA site. Okay, so myosin, can clip that third phosphate group off of ATP. And that exergonic reaction will cause energy release, and that will give myosin the energy needed to move actin across. Okay, so myosin is what is called a motor protein. It can use ATP to move. Okay, and in the thick filaments, we've got our two molecules of myosin, Okay, they're going to bind to two other molecules of myosin so that they'll be end-to-end. -end. Okay, and the head regions will be facing in opposite directions. Okay, and then we'll have whole bunches of myosin hooking together. And so here's all the different head regions of all those myosin molecules. And there's what's called the bear zone, which ends up in the middle of the sarcomere. Okay, so the bear zone is where you just have tail regions of myosins. Okay, but the thick filaments are made up of myosin. Okay, a whole bunch of myosin molecules all bonded together. Thin filaments are made up of actin, troponin, and tropomyosin. Actin is a globular protein. Okay, so here we have 1G actin. Okay, and in an actin strand, we get multiple G actins hooking together, at which point they're called F actin. And then those F actins interact to form a double helix. Okay, so the thin filament is a whole bunch of actin molecules bonded together. Each one has a myosin binding site. So each black spot on the actin molecule is a myosin binding site. Okay, and each myosin molecule has an actin binding site. Okay, the thin filaments made up of actin those myosin binding sites get covered up by a protein called tropomyosin. It's a rope-like protein. Okay, tropomyosin moves on and off those binding sites for myosin depending on what troponin tells it to do. Okay, so troponin is a regulatory protein. And troponin tells tropomyosin to either cover the binding sites for myosin on actin or to uncover them. When tropomyosin is covering the binding sites, no contraction. You're gonna have no interaction between actin and myosin. When troponin moves off the tropomyosin, off the myosin binding sites on actin, you can have contraction. Okay, so troponin tells tropomyosin what to do. Yes? Intermixed, so you, do you, okay, it's intermixed because troponin has a calcium binding site. Okay, so when calcium gets released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, depending on how much calcium gets released, some of the troponin molecules will move the tropomyosin off, but if all of them aren't bound to calcium, all of the myosin binding sites won't be activated. Right? So when you just do sort of a, a weak contraction, not that much calcium gets released. 
and not that many binding sites get activated. Whereas when you do a really intense contraction, a load of calcium gets released, so all of the binding sites get activated. Right? But when your muscles relax, all of the binding sites are covered. Okay, here we have the actual sarcomere. So we've got in that tan color, we have the thick filaments, and in blue, we have the thin filaments. So the thin filaments are thinner than the thick filaments, okay? We're also seeing titans being shown here as a spring, okay? Titan keeps your sarcomeres from being pulled apart. It's a highly elastic protein. Okay, we have a little more anatomy of the sarcomere. So we've talked about the thick filaments and the thin filaments, right? And that they're arranged in a sarcomere but there's different areas of the sarcomere we need to talk about. Okay, so the H zone, okay, is where you have only thick filaments, right? And H is a fat letter, letter, okay? So H is where you only have thick filaments. I band is where you only have thin filaments, and I is a skinny letter, okay? So that's how I remember it. H is fat, and it's where you only have thick filaments. I is skinny, and it's where you only have thin filaments. Right, as the sarcomere shortens, what happens is myosin pulls actin across it. Okay, and as there's more and more overlap between actin and myosin, the H band decreases or the H zone decreases and the I band decreases. So when the sarcomere shortens, the H zone and the I band decrease in size. And you can remember that because hi is a short way to say hello. Okay? So as the sarcomere shortens, H and I get smaller. Okay, there's also what is called the A-band. The A-band is everywhere you have myosin. Okay, so myosin is pulling actin across it. The myosin molecules themselves are not getting shorter. Okay, so the A-band remains the same. As myosin is just pulling actin across it. Okay, there's a couple things not labeled. So the M zone is in the middle. Or the, not the M zone, the M line. Okay, the M line is the middle. So if you print it out, this figure, you can just draw a line down the middle. It's the attachment site for the myosin molecules. Okay, and then the Z line is being labeled. It's the attachment site for the actin. So ends the sarcomeres. And Z is at the end of the alphabet. Right? So M is in the middle, Z is at the end. So each sarcomere has one M line and two Z lines, or sometimes you'll have them called Z discs. Right? And I'll never ask you a question if it's a zone or a band or a disc. Right? <laughs> okay. Right. Any questions about the anatomy? Okay. Yeah. So I know that you can uh, control how strong the contraction is based on how many muscle cells basically get fired off. Can you also control how strong it is by based on how many myosin heads are able to bind to the actin? Exactly. You can make a stronger contraction from a single muscle fiber by releasing even more calcium. The reason the way you release more calcium is by having higher frequency action potentials on the motor neuron. So you can get summation of contraction. Okay. All right. Let's talk about muscle contraction then. We're going to talk about the molecular basis first. Then we'll talk about neural control, characteristics, energy supply, and types of fibers. Okay. So if you want to lose weight, what are you supposed to do? Stop eating pizza and work out, right? Because muscle contraction is super energetically expensive. So we have a whole section talking about energy supply. Okay, so the way muscles contract is called the sliding filament model. Okay, so when our muscles contract is that the sarcomeres are shortening. 
Okay, when our sarcomere shortens, the H zone shortens and the I band shortens. Those Z discs get closer together as myosin pulls actin across it. Okay, and this happens end over end. So the sarcomeres are lined up end over end. So as the sarcomere shortens, the entire cell shortens. As the entire cell shortens, the entire muscle shortens. Okay, so here we have an actual micrograph. Right, showing those sarcomeres. So here's the Z discs. And notice as it contracts, those Z discs get closer together. Okay, so sarcomeres are the smallest contractile unit of your cells. Okay, so the power stroke is pulling the actin towards the M line. Okay, so we've got ATP, calcium, allowing binding sites to be available, so you get attachment, power stroke, then that ADP gets released, okay, and we still have attachment, and the myosin will only attach if another molecule of ATP binds, okay, so myosin needs one molecule ATP to do the power stroke, and one molecule of ATP to unbind. Okay, and then it is going to clip that third phosphate group off. It's going to do what's called caulking of the myosin head, and it's going to be ready to bind again. Okay, so this is crossbred cycling. You get binding of myosin, right? You get the power stroke, another molecule of ATP has to bind, you get detachment. Okay. Yeah. Are those pink dots? What are they? The these pink dots bound yeah. to the green ones? Yeah. This is troponin. Okay. This is calcium. Green dot is calcium. Pink dot is troponin. Uh purple line is tropomyosin. The blue circles with the black dots is actin. Okay, so this is all the thin filament. And then these are the myosin molecules making up the thin fil thick filaments, okay? And the M line is here and here, okay? So when myosin uses ATP to change the angle of its neck region, it is moving myosin towards the M line, right? We're gonna watch a video because videos do a really good job of showing this, okay? The contraction of a skeletal muscle generates the force necessary to move the skeleton. A contraction is triggered by a series of molecular events known as the crossbridge cycle. In a skeletal muscle fiber, the functional unit of contraction is called the sarcomere. A sarcomere shortens when myosin heads in thick myofilaments form cross bridges with actin molecules in thin myofilaments. The formation of a cross bridge is initiated when calcium ions, released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, bind to troponin. This binding causes troponin to change shape. Tropomyosin moves away from the myosin binding sites on actin, allowing the myosin head to bind actin and form a cross bridge. Also note that the myosin head must be activated before a cross bridge cycle can begin. This occurs when ATP binds to the myosin head and is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy liberated from the hydrolysis of ATP activates the myosin head, forcing it into the cocked position. A crossbridge cycle may be divided into four steps. Step 1. Crossbridge formation. The activated myosin head binds to actin, forming a crossbridge. Inorganic phosphate is released and the bond between myosin and actin becomes stronger. Step 2. The power stroke. 
ADP is released and the activated myosin head pivots, sliding the thin myofilament toward the center of the sarcomere. Step 3. Cross-bridge detachment. When another ATP binds to the myosin head, the link between the myosin head and actin weakens and the myosin head detaches. Step 4. Reactivation of the myosin head. ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy released during hydrolysis reactivates the myosin head, returning it to the cocked position. As long as the binding sites on actin remain exposed, the crossbridge cycle will repeat. And as the cycle repeats, the thin myofilaments are pulled toward each other and the sarcomere shortens. This shortening causes the whole muscle to contract. Crossbridge cycling ends when calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Troponin returns to its original shape allowing tropomyosin to glide over and cover the myosin binding site on actin. All right, so the video did a really nice job talking about the role of calcium, right? Calcium coming from that sarcoplasmic reticulum is what regulates contraction. So here we have a relaxed muscle, so the thin filament. You can't have any interaction between actin and myosin because tropomyosin is blocking the binding sites for myosin on actin. Okay, so when muscles are relaxed, low calcium in the sarcoplasm, and so troponin is keeping tropomyosin on the binding sites. So no matter how much ATP is in the cell, you're not going to have contraction because you can't have any interaction between actin and myosin. When a muscle contracts, it's because the sarcoplasmic reticulum starts to release calcium. And it starts to release calcium due to action potentials coming down those T tubules. Okay, so the motor neuron causes action potentials to fire on the muscle fiber, which causes calcium release. That calcium binds to troponin, and when it binds to troponin, troponin actually changes shape. And when it changes shape, that moves tropomyosin off of the binding sites on actin for myosin. So you can have cross-bridge cycling occur. Okay, and as long as calcium stays in the sarcoplasm, Contraction continues, right? So right now, you guys are contracting your postural muscles. Well, some of you are that are sitting up, okay? Some of you are pretty schlumpy. So those muscles that you're contracting have continued release of calcium. So that means the motor neurons are continuing to fire. 
Okay, as soon as the motor neuron stops firing, those channels on the sarcoplasm reticulum close and, and the sarcoplasm reticulum reabsorbs all the calcium. Okay, and then you go into the relaxed state. All right, so here we have a figure showing cross bridge cycling again, but I like to show this one because it shows what happens when there's no ATP. Okay, so the energized step is when myosin clips that phosphate group off of ATP, so it's cocked its head, it's ready to bind. If the binding sites on actin are not available because there's no calcium, you're gonna be in the resting state. Okay, so the myosin is activated, but it can't bind to actin. When calcium is present, you get cross bridge cycling. So you're gonna have binding of myosin to actin. It's gonna release both the ADP and the phosphate group and do the power stroke. M line's gonna be in this direction. Okay, so it's gonna pull the thin filament towards the M line. Okay, in order for its attachment to occur, it has to bind another molecule of ATP. Okay, at death, your muscle cells don't make ATP anymore. But calcium starts to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum because the cells are actually breaking down. So as calcium gets released, muscles will do one last round of contraction and form what's called the rigor complex, which is what causes rigor mortis. Okay, so that's why they're called, dead people are called stiffs because their muscles are all contracted because they can't relax, right? And then once the muscles actually degrade, Right? Rigor will go away. It's not like they make a little more ATP. It's that the muscles actually start to completely degrade. Right? Okay, any questions about that molecular basis? So the role of calcium, cross bridge cycling. Okay, so we're going to add to that by talking about how the motor neuron causes the release of calcium. Okay, so this is excitation contraction coupling. Okay, so here we have the neuromuscular junction. So we've got the axon terminal of a motor neuron. It's filled with synaptic vesicles that are full of acetylcholine. Action potential comes down the motor neuron. That opens voltage-gated calcium channels on the axon terminal. Okay, and that causes exocytosis of neurotransmitter. That should all sound really familiar. You just had an exam on it. Okay, acetylcholine is water soluble. It's just gonna diffuse across the synaptic cleft and it's going to bind to nicotinic cholinergic receptors on the motor end plate. Okay, those nicotinic cholinergic receptors are non-specific cation channels. So when they open, sodium rushes in, some potassium leaves, but way more sodium comes in. That depolarizes the muscle fiber and opens voltage-gated sodium channels, okay? The action potentials in your skeletal muscle are identical to the action potentials in your neurons, okay? Voltage-gated sodium channels open, sodium rushes in. And then voltage-gated potassium channels will open, potassium will rush out, okay? So you get depolarization and the repolarization. Okay, and it works just like in unmyelinated neurons. Every portion of the sarcolemma is gonna fire an action potential, including the down the T-tubules. Right, remember the T-tubules lie really close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which has a whole bunch of calcium inside of it. So as the action potential comes down the T-tubules, it allows calcium channels to open. Calcium rushes out, binds to troponin, moves tropomyosin off the binding sites, cross bridge cycling, muscle contracts. Okay? When action potential stops, those calcium channels will close and you have a bunch of calcium pumps on the sarcoplasmic reticulum and they pump calcium back in. Okay? So then calcium levels fall in the sarcoplasm, Calcium unbinds from troponin. Troponin moves tropomyosin back over the binding sites for myosin on actin. Muscle relaxes. Okay? Every time your sarcolemma fires an action potential, all of the calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum does not get released. Okay? So one action potential will only release some calcium. 
So that means only some thick and thin filaments will be involved in contraction. Okay. Continued action potentials will cause even more and more calcium to be released. Even more actinomyosin will get involved. Stronger contraction. Typically, a single motor neuron arising in the brain or spinal cord conducts action potentials that travel to hundreds of skeletal muscle fibers within a muscle. The sequence of events that converts action potentials in a muscle fiber to a contraction is known as excitation-contraction coupling. If we look at a single muscle fiber, we see that an action potential travels across the entire sarcolemma and is rapidly conducted into the interior of the muscle fiber by structures called transverse tubules. Transverse, or T-tubules, are regularly spaced in foldings of the sarcolemma that branch extensively throughout the muscle fiber. At numerous junctions, the T-tubules make contact with the calcium-storing membranous network known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. Where it abuts the T-tubule, the SR forms sac-like bulges called terminal cisterni. One portion of a T-tubule plus two adjacent terminal cisterni is known as a triad. The membranes of the T-tubule and terminal cisterni are linked by a series of proteins that control calcium release. As an action potential travels down the T-tubule, it causes a voltage-sensitive protein to change shape. This shape change opens a calcium release channel in the SR, allowing calcium ions to flood the sarcoplasm. This rapid influx of calcium triggers a contraction of the skeletal muscle fiber. Thus, calcium ions are responsible for the coupling of excitation to the contraction of skeletal muscle fibers. Okay, so here's a blow up of the T tubule, right, and the terminal cisterne of sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is showing that triad that the video talked about. Okay, and on the T tubule, we have the DHP receptors, and on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we have the ryanodine receptor. Okay, so here's a blow up. This is the plasma membrane of the T tubule, or the membrane of the T tubule. Here's the membrane of the sarcoplasma reticulum. Okay, so as an action potential comes down, it changes the shape of that DHP receptor, which allows the ryanodine receptor to open and allow calcium out. Okay, and calcium is going to rush out due to its electrochemical gradient. It's going to enter the sarcoplasm, where it's going to bind to troponin, move tropomyosin off the binding site, on actin for myosin, cross-bridge cycling can ensue. Okay, once the action potential stops coming down the T-tubule, you go back to this resting state. The DHP receptor goes back to its original configuration, closes the calcium ion channel. No more calcium can leave. And then the sarcoplasm reticulum is going to pump the calcium back into it. Okay, and you'll get relaxation. Okay, any, can, any questions about excitation contraction? Okay, let's start talking a little bit about characteristics of muscle contraction. Okay, so you do two main types of muscle contraction. You do isotonic and isometric. Okay, so isotonic is contraction where you move. I'm sorry, I just thought of something. Yeah. Totally. If you have an imbalance of calcium, 
Oh, so calcium, so hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia actually it affects your skeletal muscles. It can cause muscle weakness. However, it affects your heart a lot more because the calcium that controls the contraction for your heart comes both from intracellular stores and extracellular fluid. So you get arrhythmias. So people who have hyper or hypocalcemia usually go to the doctor with, you know, missing heartbeat, heart flutters, etc. Oh, okay. Like your heart is much more sensitive to calcium levels than your skeletal muscle. Oh, you feel like you feel like somewhere else. Usually, yeah. But sometimes you get a tingling sensation. Because remember, calcium also plays a role in nerve transmission. Right. Yeah. And when we talk about the endocrine system, we're going to talk about the hormones involved in calcium regulation. Because you don't want too much well, and you don't want is. too little. Right? Okay. So... Two main types of contraction, isotonic, you can actually move something, isometric, you have contraction that creates force without movement. Okay, so if this guy is capable of moving that giant weight, what kind of contraction is he going to do? Isotonic, right? And then when you do your wall sits, what kind of contraction are you doing? Isometric. Okay, so... Scientists study muscle contraction by taking muscles out of the body. And generally, they're taking them from things like frogs, right? And so here we have isometric muscle contraction. So we have a relaxed muscle, and then you zap it with some electricity, right, and cause it to contract. And as it contracts, it stretches the connective tissue, okay? So in isometric muscle contraction, your muscle contracts or shortens, but it only shortens and stretches connective tissue. So you develop tension, but you don't have any movement, okay? And isotonic, here we actually have a movable arm. When you zap this muscle, it contracts. It also stretches the connective tissue, but it contracts hard enough to actually move the load. So not only do we get tension development, we also get shortening. Okay, both involve cross bridge cycling. It's just that in isometric, okay, you have contraction that only stretches the connective tissue. You don't have movement yet. An isotonic, you stretch the connective tissue and then contract even more and have movement. Okay? We'll stop there for today. Right, so what we're going to do is talk about how you can modulate the strength of a muscle contraction. Okay, one of the major ways is increasing strength by increasing the number of muscle fibers stimulated. Right, so if you want a stronger contraction, you want more muscle fibers stimulating. Remember, motor neurons are set up in motor units. So a motor unit is a motor neuron, and all the muscle fibers, it innervates. Okay, so you're going to get more motor units involved. So bench pressing this large amount of weight versus playing a kid's accordion, which one's going to involve more muscle fibers? The bench pressing, right? Okay, frequency of stimulation. So this is how frequently the motor neuron fires an action potential. Okay, the higher the frequency of stimulation, the more calcium gets released. The more calcium that gets released, the more troponin molecules bind to the calcium. More troponin molecules binding means more tropomyosin moving off binding sites. That means more cross bridge formation. Okay, so again, higher frequency stimulation for the bench pressing. Okay, and then the last thing is the initial length of muscle fiber. So in situ or in the body, your muscle fibers are at an optimum length. Okay, but if you want optimal contraction, you don't want to have those muscles already foreshortened before you start to contract. So let's look at each of these things. So number of muscle fibers or motor units involved. So here we've got tension on the y-axis. 
Okay, and here is the tension that develops when just motor unit X is stimulated. Okay, so that means motor neuron X innervates one, two, three, four, five muscle fibers. So when motor neuron X fires, only those five muscle fibers contract and we get tension of say five grams. There's no numbers on the X, on the Y axis. Okay. When motor unit Y contracts, that motor neuron Y innervates seven fibers of the paler colored ones. Okay, so it's a stronger motor unit. So when it fires an action potential, seven fibers contract. So we get more tension, we'll say seven grams of tension. Okay, if both motor units fire at the same time, you get 12 grams of tension because all fibers are contracting. Okay. Fine motor skills, so finger movement and lip movement. You have really small motor units, okay? And they fire asynchronously in order to get fine motor control. And then your major postural muscles or your major locomotor muscles, so like your quadriceps and hamstrings have really large motor units, okay? So you get stronger contraction. Okay, motor units are all or none. So all of the muscle fibers innervated by that motor neuron, when that motor neuron fires, they all contract. Okay, so initially your brain estimates how many motor units are needed based on previous experience. Okay, so when you help your friends move and they have a box labeled pillows, right? And you say, I'll move that box. And that's big, it says it just has pillows in there. Right, so you go over there and you get ready to lift up pillows, okay? But it's actually books. They tricked you, right? You're gonna have to do what's called recruitment, okay? You're gonna have to recruit more and larger motor units. Okay, so we've got two golfers. One of them's putting, one of them's driving. Based on previous experience, you're gonna initiate fewer motor units for the putting. Okay, way more for the driving. But it takes practice to figure out how many motor units. Okay. Right, so number of motor units or muscle fibers contracting affects muscle contraction strength. More means more strength. Okay, the other characteristic that causes more strength or stronger contractions is the frequency of stimulation. The higher the frequency of stimulation, the greater the contraction strength. Okay, so far we've been talking about twitches. Okay, so we have one action potential come down the motor neuron. Okay, that motor neuron releases what neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine which binds to what kind of receptors on the motor end plate? Nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Good, everyone who came today actually knows their stuff. Okay, you guys are the ones who probably could have skipped. Okay, so it binds to nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Non-specific cation channels open, sodium rushes in, depolarizes the sarcolemma, sarcolemma fires an action potential, goes down the T-tubules, Okay, changes that shape of the DHP receptor, the RYR channel opens, calcium rushes out, binds to troponin, moves tropomyosin off, we get cross-bridge cycling. Okay, as soon as that calcium gets released, it starts to get reabsorbed by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you get one round of contraction and then the muscle relaxes. Okay, so we've been talking about twitch. In twitches, all of the calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum does not get released. Okay, there's not enough time. So twitches are actually not super strong. You get contraction and relaxation. Not super intense contraction, just contraction and relaxation. Okay, because all of the calcium doesn't get released, that means higher frequency firing of action potentials on the motor neuron can lead to summation of contraction. Okay, so you keep firing action potentials, you keep those RYR channels open, more and more calcium gets released. The more calcium that gets released, the more troponin binds to it, the more thick and thin filaments interact, the more sarcomeres start contracting. So you get stronger contraction. 
So in skeletal muscle, we can have summation of contraction, right? Tenderness occurs when the muscles don't relax at all. You have such continued release of calcium that you can't reabsorb it fast enough. So you have continual high levels of calcium in the sarcoplasm. Okay, so no relaxation at all. Continued contraction. This is not the disease tetanus that you get from stepping on rusty nails. But the reason why that disease is called tetanus is because it causes rigidity in your muscles. Right, so tetanus is a normal part of skeletal muscle contraction. Right, so let's look at a figure with all of these. Okay, so again, we have tension on the y-axis, and each one of these pink arrows is an action potential coming down a motor neuron. Okay, so here we have a single action potential on the motor neuron. Here's the result. We get contraction, relaxation. Notice there's a little bit of a lag. It doesn't contract right away. It's because you have to have time to propagate the action potential down the T-tubule, time for the calcium to be released, time for calcium to bind to troponin, trop troponin has to move tropomyosin off of the binding sites, then you get cross bridge cycling. Okay? And then as calcium is reabsorbed into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, everything reverses and you get relaxation. Okay, here we have some summation. So we get this twitch response, action potential, contraction, starts to relax because some of the calcium gets reabsorbed. Before it all gets reabsorbed, though, more calcium gets released because we have a second action potential. So notice tension is higher because even more calcium gets released. Okay, some of that starts to get reabsorbed. But before it gets reabsorbed, another action potential is fired, even more calcium released, higher contraction strength. Okay. We increase the frequency of action potentials, and we get to what's called unfused or incomplete tetanus. Okay. You wouldn't notice your muscle contracting and relaxing at this point. You'd see, it would seem to be sustained contraction. Okay. You're not going to notice these upward and downward blips in tension. Okay. This would be a sustained contraction in your eyes. Okay. Super high frequency contraction leads to complete or fused tension, okay? Calcium release is equal to calcium reabsorption, okay? And you get saturation of troponin with calcium. So you get all the sarcomeres involved. So this is the strongest contraction that particular muscle can do. Soon as action potentials stop, relaxation occurs. So in lab, you guys did the hand dynamometer. You had to squeeze as hard as you can, right? And what happened the second time you had to squeeze as long as you can? Could you squeeze for as long or as hard? No, right? So after ten tetanus occurs, that muscle needs a little time for a recovery. Yeah, question? Does that complete tetanus no, it does not damage the muscle. Tetanus is a normal part of skeletal muscle contraction. It doesn't damage it, it's just that that muscle will undergo fatigue and just needs time to recover ATP stores, etc. Right? Get rid of any lactic acid it might have produced. Okay? But tetanus does not damage your muscles. Okay? Just fatigues them. Okay, the last thing that can affect contraction strength is fiber length. Okay, in situ or inside your body, the resting length of the muscle is usually the optimal length for tension development. Right? You don't want your muscles to get pulled apart because then you're not going to have as much overlap. It'll be harder to contract. And you also don't want your muscles all smushed together because then there'll be too much overlap. Right, so let's look at this in a figure form. It might make a little more sense. So here we have tension as a percent of maximum. So 100% is 
is the maximum tension of that particular muscle fiber. And then we have sarcomeres here. So here are those Z discs, the M line would be here. Orange are the thick filaments or the myosin. Blue is the thin filaments or the actin. Okay, so at rest, your muscles have lots of overlap, but not too much overlap between the thick and thin filaments. Okay, those sarcomeres can still shorten so that they can do maximal tension development. Okay, if you start to pull those muscles apart, the sarcomeres start to get pulled apart. Okay, and you don't get as much overlap with the actin and myosin. Right? There's a protein called Titan, which isn't being shown on here, which actually attaches the thick filaments to the Z-discs, and it's going to prevent your muscle from being completely pulled. Right? And then skeletal muscles have stretch receptors, so they're going to detect this. So in the knee jerk reflex, okay, when you hit the patellar tendon, that stretched some of the sarcomeres in your quadricep, the stretch receptor detected that, and what did you do in response? You did a kick, right? You contracted the quadriceps. Hey, you also don't want to smush up your muscles before you try to contract them, because then they have too much overlap, they're not going to be able to overlap, and again, you won't be able to develop optimal tension. Right? But in the body, your muscles are set up to be at optimal resting length. Okay. Any questions about those characteristics? Yeah? Is that length, like, just learn through experience? Like, does your brain learn how to where to let those relax so they have that optimal tension? No, it's anatomy. Right? So it occurs during development. Those muscles are the proper length and, you know, are oriented properly so that they're at the optimal resting length. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, uh, with, uh, I guess, like bodybuilders and stuff. Yeah. People who do a lot of curls, for example, their arms don't fully extend. Is that because the muscles get in condition to where it's just always contracted in a way? Or oh, so yeah. So it, they might not extend all the way because so A, it's going to put a lot right of. Here. Yeah, it's going to put a lot of stress on their joints, for one thing. And then also, yeah, if they extend it, that might actually be stretching their um, biceps, right? So they want to keep it so that the bicep is at optimal resting length for best force development. Yeah, because you usually don't walk around with your arms fully extended, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, because uh, when you fully extend your arm, you're actually stretching your bicep a little bit. You could walk around with your arms fully extended. You just look weird, right? <laughs> okay, any other questions about characteristics? All right, let's talk about energy supply. Muscle contraction is energetically expensive. So if you went outside, it's not 100% efficient. So if you went outside right now without your coat on, what would you start to do? Shiver, Shiver right? And that's one way we produce heat. Right, to maintain our high body temperature is that we actually contract our muscles because it's not 100% efficient. That conversion of the ATP to actual movement causes a lot of heat production. Okay, so that means we have to replenish that ATP to continue the contraction. So we need ATP to do cross bridge formation. So remember, myosin has to bind to a molecule of ATP before it'll bind to actin. Okay, we need a mo another molecule of ATP for gross bridge detachment. Because once myosin does the power stroke and releases that ADP, it needs another molecule of ATP in order to unbind from actin. Right? And then it cocks the head and gets ready for the next cross bridge formation. Okay, we also need calcium, or we need ATP for the calcium pumps. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum it has all these calcium pumps on it, which use one molecule of ATP to pump calcium from the sarcoplasm into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to cause relaxation. So not only do you need ATP for contraction, you need ATP for relaxation. 
Okay, and then our skeletal muscle, because they are excitable cells, have loads of sodium and potassium pumps in order to bring the membrane back to rest. Okay, so excitable cells have loads of sodium potassium pumps, which use one molecule of ATP to pump three sodium out, two potassium in. Okay, so if you want to lose weight, you're supposed to eat less and exercise because you'll burn through loads of calories. This is also why people who have more muscle mass than someone of the same weight will have higher metabolisms or higher calorie needs, okay, because muscles are energetically expensive to maintain. Okay, here's just a reminder of ATP, okay. So those three phosphate groups, they don't want to be next to each other. So breaking those phosphate group bonds leads to a release of energy that myosin can use to move actin across it, or the calcium pumps can use to pump calcium back in, or the sodium potassium pumps can use to pump sodium and potassium. Hi. So ATP gets used heavily and it has to be replenished, okay? There are some just free ATP hanging out in your muscles, but within seconds it's depleted, okay? The amount of free ATP is really low in muscle cells, really quickly gets depleted, okay? The next source of ATP or next way to regenerate ATP is through phosphocreatine. Okay, so you probably have heard of creatine. It's a really common supplement, especially in people who are doing bodybuilding or sprinting. Okay, the idea behind creatine supplements is that you'll pack your muscles full of creatine, and during rest, you're gonna make phosphocreatine. Okay, and you'll make phosphocreatine by ATP donating a phosphate group. So you've got a phosphate group on phosphocreatine, and then as you have ADP, being formed during exercise, it's just one enzymatic step of phosphocreatine adding a phosphate group to ADP to make ATP. Okay, so this is really quick. Okay, phosphocreatine throws the phosphate group onto ADP. You've got more ATP for muscle contraction. Super quick. However, the problem is the concentration of phosphocreatine is only three to five times that of resting free ATP. Okay, so you blow through your phosphocreatine super fast. So people take creatine supplements in hopes that they'll increase the amount of phosphocreatine in their muscles for super intense muscle contraction. Okay. If you don't need it, you just pee it out. Okay. So a good way to make expensive urine is to take creatine supplements. Okay. All right, phosphocreatine is the fastest way we have to replenish ATP, but supplies are limited, okay? So then muscle cells are gonna look elsewhere for ATP production. For quick energy, okay, the second fastest way is anaerobic glycolysis, and the slowest but most efficient way is aerobic metabolism. Okay, so here we have a muscle cell Okay, and we've got a capillary that's supplying oxygen for electron transport. Hopefully this is looking familiar. Okay, we've got some glucose from the bloodstream or we might have glycogen stores inside the muscle. Okay, that glucose, either from glycogen or glucose, can go through glycolysis. If oxygen's not available or if ATP is needed really fast, we can do anaerobic glycolysis, converting pyruvate into lactate. Okay, does not require oxygen. However, it causes the buildup of lactic acids, which leads to fatigue. Okay, if time is not of the essence, okay, so if you're not doing super intense muscle contraction, say you're just out for a leisurely walk, okay, that pyruvate is gonna be taken into the mitochondria, do the Krebs cycle, electron transport, and you'll basically have an unlimited supply of ATP. Okay, but there's more enzymatic steps involved. You have to go into the mitochondria, oxygen has to be available, you gotta do the Krebs cycle, right? So it's slower, <coughs> but unlimited. Yes? How does this process change when you have 
have someone that's very sedentary, not physical <laughs> fit, and someone that's very like high stamina, tons of energy. Right. Right. Going. Right. So we'll call them couch potatoes. Couch potatoes, <laughs> okay, when they get up and go for a leisurely walk, it's not so leisurely for them, right? They might, you might notice that they huff and puff when you're just sort of, if you're normally exercising, when you're just sort of leisurely walking. So they may go anaerobic during what is aerobic for you. And that's because they have different muscle fiber types, okay? So if you don't train your muscle fibers, they're going to switch types. Okay, and they're actually going to go anaerobic more likely. And we'll talk about fiber types in a second. Right? But training causes changes in your muscle fiber types. And when you do aerobic training, right, you're going to get lots of aerobic fibers that are really efficient. And you're going to use aerobic respiration. Because that's the goal for endurance athletes. Right? You don't want fatigue. If you're a sprinter, you just want speed. And you want really big fibers. And it's okay if they go anaerobic, right? Because you just have to run for 10 seconds in the 100 meter dash. Or you just really have to, I don't even know what big power lifters lift. A couple hundred pounds? Sure, sure. You're going to go with a couple hundred pounds. Okay, so here we have two figures for light exercise versus intense exercise. And we're going to say these are for people who are just average exercisers, right? So this isn't couch potatoes. This isn't fully trained athletes. They're just sort of average active humans, okay? And we've got energy used per source on both y-axis and time on both x-axis. Okay, so for light exercise, you're going to blow through your creatine phosphate. But notice the slope is a little less steep than it is for intense exercise, right? But you blow through it really fast. Okay, and then you're going to do a little bit of anaerobic glycolysis to get things going. But within the first two minutes, you switch over to doing only aerobic. Okay, so oxidative phosphorylation is aerobic respiration. Okay, you're going to be doing the Krebs cycle you're gonna be doing electron transport, okay? You're gonna be able to continue to do this light exercise for hours, okay? Intense exercise. This is if I told you to leave that door and run as hard as you can for as long as you can, okay? You're gonna blow through your creatine phosphate within the first minute, okay? And you're gonna go completely anaerobic until you're basically going to be slowing down here, having lactic acid build up. You're going to do some aerobic respiration. But basically, you're, you're going to be able to sprint pretty fast for four minutes, and then you're going to slow way down after those four minutes because you're switching to aerobic. Okay? And aerobic respiration just can't fuel super intense, super fast contraction rates. Okay? And that's why the difference between the 100 and 200 meter is not that much. You just basically double the 100 meter times because you can do super intense contraction for the 20 seconds needed, right? But once you go to the 400 meter and you look at those times, it's not like you just multiply the 100 meter by four, right? They start to slow down. That's because they have to use some aerobic respiration for 400 meters and beyond. Okay. Any questions about those energy supplies before we do our last thing, which is fiber types? Okay. So, humans have three major fiber types. Okay, and muscles, our muscles are mixed fiber types. Okay, if you think of chickens, how they have in Turkey, okay, they have light meat and, or white meat and dark meat. Okay, that's because their fiber types aren't as mixed, and fish don't mix their fiber types at all. Okay, so those of you who are fishermen or eat a lot of fish, the white is their fast twitch that they use for swimming fast. Okay, and then along the spine, they have reddish colored or darker muscle, and that's their oxidative fibers that they use just for cruising. Right, but most mammals have mixed fiber types, so we're gonna have some fast twitch and slow twitch all in the same muscle. Okay, and we're gonna name them by their descriptive terms. 
Okay, so we're going to call them fast twitch glycolytic, fast twitch oxidative, and slow twitch oxidative. And so here we have a figure of three muscles that fit those specific fiber types found in the human body. What I want you to notice is on the y-axis we have tension as a percent of maximum. Okay, this does not mean your extraocular muscle, the amount of tension it develops is as strong as your gastrocnemius. Okay, where is the gastrocnemius in the soleus found? In your calf, exactly. Okay, so obviously they're much stronger than extraocular muscles. If your extraocular muscles, is, was that strong, your eyes would pop out of your head, right? Okay, but your extraocular muscle is a fast twitch glycolytic fiber. Okay, we have a single action potential on a motor neuron. It contracts the fastest and it relaxes the fastest. Okay. The gastrocnemius is a fast switch oxidative. It contracts pretty fast, right, and it relaxes pretty fast. But notice it's slower or it's intermediate between the fast switch glycolytic and the slow twitch oxidative. The slow twitch oxidative is slow to contract as well as slow to relax. Okay. So I have this awesome table which probably looks really boring, okay? You don't necessarily need to memorize it. It should make intuitive sense once we go through it, okay? So we've got our fast twitch glycolytic, like our extraocular muscle, our fast twitch oxidative, like the gastrocnemius, and the slow twitch oxidative, like the soleus. Okay, contraction speed should be obvious based on the name. Fast twitch fibers are fast to contract, Slow twitch fibers are slow to contract. That's why I'm calling them by their descriptive names. Okay. Endurance. Okay, fast twitch glycolytic has low endurance. Right? And the reason it has low endurance is because it relies on anaerobic glycolysis for ATP production. And so you get the formation of lactic acid, which causes fatigue. Okay, so you do not use fast twitch glycolytic fibers for endurance activities, things like posture, okay? So your postural muscles are mainly slow twitch oxidative because you don't want them to fatigue. You'll just fall over in your chair, right? And they have to work all the time. Okay, your fast twitch oxidative and slow twitch oxidative have high endurance. And the reason they have high endurance is because they rely on aerobic respiration. So they get a continual supply of ATP. Okay, so they don't have formation of lactic acid. They don't have fatigue. That's as fast as a fast switch glycolytic. Okay, glycolytic ability is the amount of glycolytic enzymes, how much it relies on glucose. Okay, your fast switch fibers have a high ability to do glycolysis. Okay, your fast switch glycolytic are only going to do glycolysis. Your fast switch oxidative are going to do glycolysis, but they're going to take the pyruvate into the mitochondria. Okay, so they like to use glucose as an energy molecule, but they don't use it anaerobically. Slow twitch oxidative fibers don't have a lot of glycolytic enzymes. So what molecule do you think they are using for ATP production? If they're not using carbohydrates, what do you think they're using? What's the other preferred energy molecule besides carbohydrates for making ATP? Fats. Fats, exactly. They use a lot of lipids. Okay, so slow twitch oxidative happily run off of lipids. Okay, oxidative capacity tells you something about how many mitochondria they have, how much aerobic respiration they do. If they're fast twitch glycolytic, very little. If they're oxidative, a lot. Okay, so the oxidative fibers have high oxidative capacity. Okay, glycogen content. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose. If you like to use glucose, you want to store it. Okay, so fast twitch glycolytic have high amounts of glucose storage, so high glycogen. Oxidative of fast twitch have an intermediate amount. Slow twitch oxidative don't use glucose, so they don't have glycogen stores. Okay, capillaries. What are capillaries bringing to your muscles? Oxygen. 
Okay? So if you're not using oxygen because you're a glycolytic fiber, you don't need a bunch of capillaries going to you. Okay, so fast twitch glycolytic muscles have few capillaries going to them because they're not relying on aerobic respiration. Whereas the oxidative fibers have loads of capillaries going to them. Okay, who knows what myoglobin is? Who knows what hemoglobin is? Yeah. It carries oxygen where? You find hemoglobin in your, in your blood cells, okay? Myoglobin is just like hemoglobin, except it's found in muscles, okay? So myoglobin binds oxygen in your muscles, okay? So you want lots of myoglobin if you're an oxidative fiber, because if you're an oxidative fiber, you're doing aerobic respiration, and you need oxygen for the electron transport chain, okay? Oxygen's the terminal electron acceptor. Myoglobin, just like hemoglobin, when it's bound to oxygen, it is reddish in color. And so the amount of myoglobin determines the color of the fiber. Okay, and that's where this color coding is coming from. Okay, so slow twitch oxidative fibers have loads of myoglobin and therefore are dark red in appearance. Fast-rich oxidative also have a lot of myoglobin. However, they're just red in appearance, okay? Very little myoglobin in fast-rich glycolytic. So they are pale in appearance, okay? So if you prefer white meat when you eat chicken or turkey, you like fast-rich glycolytic fibers, okay? And if you prefer dark meat, you like the slow twitch oxidative fibers. And the reason why a lot of people like dark meat better is because dark meat also stores a lot more fat, okay? It makes it more delicious. That's why the white meat always dries out because it doesn't do fat storage because it doesn't use fat for ATP production. Okay, diameter determines how strong the fibers are. Fast twitch glycolytic fibers, when someone has trained them, okay? are large in diameter. They have loads of actin and myosin. Large in cross-section, they can do intense contraction, develop a lot of tension. Fast twitch oxidative are medium in diameter. Slow twitch oxidative are small in diameter. Okay, so they can go forever, but you're not gonna get super intense contraction from them. Right, so back to your question about couch potatoes. Okay, couch potatoes, when they are not training at all, when they're not using their muscles, your muscle fibers will actually default to these fast twitch glycolytic fibers. They're not gonna be fat ones, okay? You're not gonna have a lot of actin and myosin in them, but the reason why it defaults to fast twitch glycolytic is because it's very few mitochondria and very few capillaries, okay? So they're really cheap to maintain in a resting state. Okay, they're not gonna be big, fast twitch glycolytic muscles. They're gonna be small ones, okay? But that means when you do use them, you go anaerobic immediately, right? So that leads to fatigue really fast and then soreness the next day. Okay, so you can switch between fiber types. Okay, so we've got some world-class sprinters and some world-class marathoners. World-class sprinters, what fiber types are they gonna have a lot of? Fast twitch oxidative and fast twitch glycolytic. They want fast twitch fibers, right? Whereas your endurance athletes, what do they want a lot of? Slow twitch oxidative, as well as some fast twitch oxidative. Because those marathoners, I guarantee, can still run a mile faster than you can, <laughs> right? So they still have some fast twitch oxidative fibers in there, okay? There is some amount of genetic predisposition. You've probably heard the saying, sprinters are born, not made. Some of you in the room can train and put on really nice, big, fast twitch glycolytic fibers. Okay, some of you will drink all the protein shakes in the world and do all the bench pressing in the world and you still don't get really bulked up 
Okay, that's genetics. Everyone has some ability to switch between fiber types. Okay, as I said earlier, our muscles are mixtures of fiber types. So here we actually have a cross section of a human's muscle. Okay, so we've got this big, fat, pale muscle fiber. What kind do you think it is? Fast twitch glycolytic. Okay, why is it pale? Not a lot of myoglobin. Okay, also notice these really dark things, these little dark spots. Those are capillaries. Notice there's not a lot of capillaries around them. Okay, if we look down here, we've got these darker red muscle fibers, okay, with lots of capillaries surrounding them. What kind of muscle fibers do you think those are? Slow twitch, Slow twitch oxidative, okay, loads of capillaries to bring the oxygen, loads of myoglobin to supply those capillaries with oxygen. And here would be an intermediate one. It's red in appearance. I know none of this is coming up as red, right? It's medium dark, we'll say, in appearance, has capillaries surrounding it, and it's medium in diameter, right? So that would be a fast twitch oxidative. Okay. If you do endurance training, you're going to switch your fast twitch glycolytic to fast twitch oxidative. Whereas strength training is going to cause a switch to the fast twitch glycolytic. Okay, but you have to do training. Or take steroids, right? So testosterone, the reason why steroids are so commonly abused is A, because they're cheap, and B, they're super effective. Okay, remember there's all those nuclei in our muscle fibers? Okay, they have nuclear receptors for testosterone. Testosterone tells the nucleus to cause transcription of genes for actin and myosin, and that causes hypertrophy of the muscle cells. So you don't make new muscle cells, you just make fatter muscle cells. So you add a ton of actin and myosin, right? Okay, last thing we'll talk about is muscle fatigue. Okay, so if you're doing super high intensity exercise, Lactic acid can cause fatigue. And why do you think lactic acid causes fatigue? It's acidic. It's acidic, exactly. And why don't you want your cells to become acidic? Because it hurts. Before it even hurts. Because it, what, do, what does pH affect? Proteins. And what are your muscles filled with? Protein. Okay, so you don't want your muscles to become acidic. Okay, so your muscles will actually fatigue and export all, all that lactic acid, right? And then your liver will convert it back to pyruvate. Okay, but you don't want too much lactic acid building up in your muscle cells because it'll actually cause denaturation to occur. Okay, high intensity exercise, when your muscles contract, they actually compress the blood vessels. Okay, so you don't get oxygen going to them during high intensity contraction. And so that will also cause fatigue because you have to rely completely on anaerobic glycolysis, which causes built up of lactic acid. Then sometimes you can get depletion of acetylcholine, but you have to be a pretty intense person, I think, for this to happen. Most people just crap out on their own before they get neuromuscular fatigue, where their motor neurons actually run out of acetylcholine, okay? This would probably happen if you were like running for your life, right? Low intensity exercise, you can get depletion of energy reserves, but that will take hours and hours, okay? You just run out of glucose, glycogen, and fatty acids, but again, it'll take hours. Okay, other possibilities is inorganic phosphates. These aren't well proven, but if you're always clipping off phosphate from ATP, you can have a buildup of that phosphate and that could lead to ion imbalances. Okay, the other thing is changes in ion distribution. Okay, especially sodium and potassium. So if you regularly get muscle cramps, what are you often deficient in? I'm supposed to eat potassium. Right, so that's why you're supposed to have bananas. And you might notice you're much more likely to get muscle cramps in the summer than in the winter, and who knows why. 
What do you do in the summer that you don't do in the winter? Sweat. sweat. And what happens when you sweat? Well, you lose ions. Yeah, yeah. When you sweat, you're supposed to drink water. That's good. Yeah. But you lose ions, okay? So that is why muscle cramping is much more common in the summer than in the winter because you're losing ions as you sweat as well. Okay, and this is the fatigue that your coach is always talking about, right? Central fatigue, where you just, you just can't do it anymore, right? And the coach says it's all in your head. It is, right? Most of us fatigue due to psychological fatigue, okay? All right, so here is our last figure where we're showing muscle fatigue. So here we've got not too high frequency stimulation. We've got round of contraction and relaxation, so full relaxation before the next action potential on the motor neuron. Okay, here we're getting even higher frequency action potentials. And notice eventually we hit a point where contraction, the amount of tension, starts to decrease. So this is actual fatigue. Okay, we could see this response if we electrically stimulated your muscles. Okay, we get less and less of a response. And then this is what happened to you guys in lab where you were using the hand dynamometer, right? And you squeezed as hard as you could. Okay, most of you probably experienced psychological fatigue than real fatigue. Okay, but real fatigue would happen and you'd see a decrease in tension even though that motor neuron's still firing. Okay, and even after a short rest period, you would experience fatigue much faster, right? Because of inorganic phosphate buildup, ion distribution, lactic acid being in there, etc. Okay, so you need a longer rest period before you don't experience fatigue really quickly. Okay, any questions about muscles? Yeah. Whatever the situation may be, when you're when you're trying to move your muscles, like there's too much fatigue and such that's built up, on a you know found this side, what's actually happening so that it doesn't work? Like if you know, I do a hundred curls, whatever, and I try to do that in a the last one, yeah, yeah. So that fatigue, it could be lactic acid buildup. Right, it could be inorganic phosphate buildup, it could be neuromuscular fatigue where your motor neuron actually ran out of acetylcholine. So, it could be ion imbalances. So all those things listed under possible reasons for fatigue. That's what's happening. So the signal's being sent, it's just somewhere along the line. Something's being deprived. Right, the only one where the signal is no longer being sent is neuromuscular fatigue. Neuromuscular fatigue means that the motor neuron has run out of acetylcholine, so it's not sending a signal to your muscle. Generally what happens is there's something inside the muscle that's causing fatigue. Usually it's lactic acid buildup, right? And then ion disturbances, right? So not enough potassium, you could get cramping occurring, okay? Or it could be you've depleted all resources, so you don't have any glucose left or glycogen left or fatty acids left to make more ATP. So it's still trying to do the work, it's just that the it can't. resources are not there to make it happen. It has undergone fatigue. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, any other muscle questions? All right.